Have returning to the show, Mr. Stephen Stanton, or as we shall call him, Admiral Tarkin. Ah, oh, yes, Admiral Tarkin. Thank you for giving me the correct rank. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you get this rank promotion? I know suddenly you went from being captain, and now the next thing we know, you're an admiral. So how did you get this promotion? I think it happened during the uh, the droid arc, everybody's favorite uh, arc from Season 5 with uh, Colonel Mieber Gashgam and... Uh, I think uh, Tarkin got his promotion during that episode, and um, I'm not really sure what happened that, uh, you know, because a lot of time has passed between season three and season five, you know, a lot of changes apparently, so he's worked his way up uh, pretty quickly, I think. But yeah, I think you'd have to ask Dave Filoni to find out exactly what the circumstances were about that. There's probably a backstory. I'm sure there is. I don't know, maybe he just saw that awesome explosion and got promoted for being exposed to it, because that was an amazing explosion in that episode. That, that was, was a pretty cool explosion, actually. It was. Dave told me he showed that to the guys at ILM before they screened it, and he said they were envious and just in awe of what those guys were, were doing, because that's, that's, you know, that's something like you'd see in a Star Wars movie. You, know, you don't expect to see something on that level in, in the Clone Wars. It was it was great. I remember when they sent me the screeners for those uh, episodes, I watched that explosion over and over again, and the sound even wasn't, wasn't even mixed yet, and it still looked great. Yeah, that, that visually, um, from that point on, the Clone Wars even went higher visually than I've ever seen it. You know, from that point to the finale, it was... It was movie quality, like outright better than movie quality a lot of the time. It was amazing. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it started to look more like Star Wars than it did. Uh, it started looking less like the prequel and more like the original trilogy, which that always is very cool when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had all those images of like the Imperial prisons, of Coruscant, of the trials, of lots of stuff that Tarkin was involved with. Um, a lot of the stuff was very, very awesome imagery, like um, the episode where um, Ahsoka gets escapes from the prison you know the whole imperial prison there and like her on top of the statues and so on that was very much empire strikes back type imagery and it was glorious yeah there was a lot of that i know someone had uh, someone had gone online and done like a frame by frame comparison of those scenes in the clone wars and where they were sort of like mimicked or you could see them mirrored in the original trilogy like vader walking down the hall of the death star in the detention center opening the door seeing leia you know tarkin grabbing leia by the chin as he's interrogating her so yeah it's anytime you know you start moving uh, moving ahead in the saga and starting to get more towards a new hope i think people get really that's really exciting because that's the one that started it all and got everybody excited in the first place indeed and last time you're on you mentioned how you were in uh, 11 episodes of uh, season 5, and I had a lot of fun finding which episodes they were. Some of them are obvious, right. but, you know, like early on with the, uh, I believe you were the circus uh, ringmaster guy. Yeah, Prego, uh, the, the whole common joy in the circus, you young Jedi. That guy with the big twirly mustache and everything. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and then, of course, you were Gascon and you were Tarkin. Um, I thought there was another character. But... Um, let's see. Well, let's. Well, there probably was. I mean, they we, they didn't show uh, the Clovis arc. I was in that, but that got kind of. I think I got pushed aside to make uh, way for the Young Jedi arc. Um, yeah, I can't remember offhand. Um, but uh, yeah, there was definitely a lot of episodes in in season five that I got to participate in, when it was a lot of fun to do that. It's kind of hard and sometimes they, to figure out because th you'll get scripts and they'll be numbered one way and then you end up shuffling them around in the season. Like I remember working on season five and getting episodes, you know, that had an a indication that it was maybe a carryover from season four or whatever. You know, they they must write all these things and have a giant stockpile of them, you know, and then start choosing their arcs and getting the flow of the season and everything like that. So sometimes there's some mixing and matching, but that goes on with every TV series. Yeah, and um, as uh, Tom Kane was telling us uh, a week ago, or a week or two ago, you know, he, he finds it hard to figure out which season he's in because he, they record so you guys record so much, you record so far ahead that sometimes you just you just mix what you're doing because it's been a year or so since you recorded them last, and so you really have no idea what's there and what's not. Yeah, and Tom, of course, he's in every episode because he's always, uh, you know, at least the narrator, if not another character like Yoda or something like that. So yeah, I can't even imagine how he tries to keep it straight in his head after doing like from episode one all the way to the final episode. I mean, that's a lot of episodes. 
Indeed. That's got so, to be green. Um, Just a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that, well, yes, 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 it does. So I guess one question I got to ask is, um, season five is officially the last uh, full season of the Clone Wars that we're going to get. We might get a couple arcs or something in season six, whatever they call bonus content. So uh, how do you feel about the, the way the Clone Wars went out? Well, I think if, if it had to go out, I think it couldn't have gone out on a better set of episodes. I think it really went out with a bang. I mean, that those things were so packed with not only action, but emotion and just you know, everything that I think people love about Star Wars, um, you know, guys, you know, when you watch that, uh, that sort of swan song episode, I mean, uh, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think they could have gone out on a better episode. I mean, they think if they would really had to, to top that, that'd be really difficult to do. I mean, that was just a tremendous arc in general. And the, the finale episode was just uh, top notch all the way around. So just talking about the finale, your character, um, Tarkin, had a lot to do in the finale arc. He was, a lot of people would say he'd be the, the antagonist because he was the one that was basically pushing Ahsoka to her fate. Right. So um, uh, let's see if I can word this question right. So do you feel that Tarkin actually thought she was guilty or was there someone else pushing him along that perhaps was manipulating things in the entire process. You know, I don't know so much about someone pushing him along. Uh, when we started that arc, like I said, there'd been a lot of time had passed. We'd only seen Tarkin briefly in the end of the droid arc, which was right before this one. And uh, I remember Dave Filoni uh, was talking to me about Tarkin's position in this arc, and he's saying, you know, the character has changed. You know, he's been promoted to Admiral, and now we're going to start seeing him go for that power grab. Tarkin's, you know, he's hungry for power. We don't really know exactly why or what his backstory is yet. I think there's still a lot that, you know, that can be told about that character. But it wasn't so much that someone was pushing him. I think it was Tarkin's own lust for glory or power or whatever it is that he wanted to get the Jedi out of the way so he could do things his way. Uh, so that was kind of like the jumping off point for that, uh, for that arc. And another one of the characters you got to play this last season was also one that not necessarily wanted power but wanted uh, respect that he felt he, he deserved. And that, of course, being uh, Gascon, everyone's favorite little guy. Yes, Kurt for that, for that, Gash gone. <laughs> I don't know if he was everybody's favorite little guy. <laughs> He's definitely one of my favorites. I really enjoy playing him because he was such a um, uh, that that whole set of arcs that Brent Friedman wrote, uh, who also wrote the arc, uh, the Moralo Evol arc uh, that I was uh, able to participate in. Yeah, we love Brent Friedman. He's supposed to have been on the show a while ago, but our request since December for him and with Lucasfilm's been lost, and so. We're just waiting, and we might have to just wait till he's done with so his, since his till his contract is done. But yeah, Brent Friedman's he's a great guy. Yeah, we want yeah. him on. No, he's he's definitely a great guy, and he writes some incredible stuff. And uh, the Gascon arc, you know, if you saw the interview with him on StarWars.com, you know, he kind of lays it out for you where George said he wanted to do a an arc or at least an episode that was about nothing, and you know, it was kind of like everyone backing their chairs away from the table, you know, none of the writers wanting to touch it, and he kind of dove in and, and did that, and you know, that was one of the uh, I've mentioned before, it's one of the great things about having a television series. Uh, you're not locked into like a two-hour, you know, uh, setting where you've got to tell a story and you, can, and you can't have a lot of extraneous material. Because The Clone Wars is about everything that happened in The Clone Wars, you could go off on these, you know, these tangents and talk about different things that happened and, and um, take a risk. And I thought they took a really big risk with this, and I was really uh, glad to be a part of it because it was so much fun to do that character and just, you know, do something that was so out of the box, so to speak, for Clone Wars. So a lot of people, um, you know, as you hinted at before, weren't necessarily the biggest fan of, of that arc, but, you know, you loved Gascon, and you can tell from the interviews and so on that we've seen with you talking about him. So what about Gascon, um, Colonel Gascon, have, you know, really uh, turned you on to him, like that you that you really appreciate him for? What 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 is he like that everyone should really appreciate him for? Well, I just think because he's <laughs> he's funny for one thing. I mean, there's there's a lot of humor back in if you watch the original Star Wars. I mean, it, the prequels are much much darker than the original trilogy. I mean, there there's a whole you know it's a different sort of take on the on the saga that you're watching in the prequels. But if you watch the uh, the original <laughs> Star Wars, there's so many laughs in there. Whether it's three PO or you know Han and Chewie and you know there's just there's a lot of humor in there. And you know the 
Clone Wars, I think, uh, you know, I think those episodes kind of brought back a lot of that sort of uh, sort of swashbuckling sort of humor that you got from the original Star Wars and kind of reminded people that Star Wars isn't necessarily all a dark tragedy. It does have its moments of lightness and, and definitely a lot of humor in it. So I think that's part of the reason why I like playing that character so much and because he was just... I played so many villains in the Clone Wars. It was nice to do something that was completely on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, a guy who seems very confident but actually isn't and is very much out of his element uh, leading uh, anything, uh, especially a, a group of droids, into battle or on a mission. And the, the highlight of that arc is how Gascon basically reawakened um, the sense of loyalty inside uh, Republic Commando Gregor, who... I guess kind of stole the show in the third episode of, of that arc. So um, let's see if I can word this right. I, I have it worded here, but it, I don't think it come, it's the it's appropriate word. But so with with Gascon, you know, the whole point of it was he had to find who he was himself. He you know at first he wanted a lot of respect. He wanted a lot of wanted the droids to follow him and felt he deserved a lot more than he got. So by the end of that arc, how do you feel that he and the other droids grew as characters from the from the very beginning? How did they how did they change and do you wish to see more of Gascon and those droids in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see them team up again or Gascon with the young Jedi because I think they, that would be just as much of a challenge for him. You know, now that he thinks he has the droids in control to deal with some kids, I think that would really push him over the edge. Uh, but I think, you know, the droids are pretty much, they stay constant. I don't really th think we really see too much with the droids other than the learning curve that they might go through as, as mechs, you know, learning what works in a particular situation and how to do something better the next time because it's based on programming. Um, but, you know, I think the change, so because the droids stay constant, I think that's why you see the change in personality uh, from Gascon because he can't argue with their logic. It's solid, you know, it, it, it works. So, you know, R2 is always besting him, which is what R2 does with all the characters around him, usually. R2 was always besting C-3PO. It made, 3PO was like Gascon. It, R2 constantly drove, drove him crazy. And 3PO was the emotional one. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, that's where you get to see the, 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 the big character changes between Gascon and somewhat with Wack, because Wack finally gets, you know, he teaches Gascon, and then he he gets the respect that you know he longs for, and of course, and so he 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 becomes a much more responsible uh, droid uh, once he's uh, gotten uh, Gascon's respect. So, I think uh, there you go. That's a long answer. I don't even know where the question started anymore. It was a it was a good answer for a long winded question. It was a good answer. Yes, <laughs> I will have to agree with that. Yeah. So on. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. So unfortunately, um, Lucasfilm and Disney decided to not continue the Clone Wars um, as we know it. Um, mm. They did say we're getting bonus content, whatever that means. So from what we've heard, Season 6 was basically recorded, and we know they work was well underway on Season 6. Mm -hmm. So do you have any hints or ideas of stuff that we might be getting with those bonus content or any ideas of stuff that you hope we can get or character resolution that we might get any anything like that that the fans might be able to grasp onto yeah i don't know i mean it's really i mean they, they recorded so much material and all of it's good as far as i'm concerned so you know I, it's i have no idea what it is they're going to who knows maybe they'll marry a whole bunch of stuff together and make dvds uh, maybe it'll be released theatrically. Uh, you know, I think the options are wide open. I think we just kind of have to to wait and see. Um, you know, right now, I think, you know, because the Clone Wars is wrapping up, and I can understand why they would want to do that. 2015 is not that far away. And, you know, we've got on um, how many motion pictures in the works now? Five? And five? And yeah, five. I doubt they're going to come That's... out in 2015. That seems rather optimistic. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff to start getting excited about you know i remember when you know the original trilogy came out i mean when the first one came out it was kind of like well what is this thing you know i guess i'll go see it it looks kind of weird or you know it was described as you know this farm boy who's being held by a wizard to go rescue a princess and then help with two robots and you know i remember reading the article in the paper and the picture of the two robots was wrong they showed two stormtroopers and i thought well okay this is another one of those low budget science fiction things you know? <laughs> another b movie so, coming at you I, I went and went and saw it and of course was completely blown away i'd never seen anything like it because you know as a kid i'd never seen 2001 a space odyssey which is about that or silent running about the only things that came close to that level 
of expertise in the special effects. So, you know, then that thing comes out, and then all of a sudden, all we hear there's going to be a sequel. I remember just everyone waiting the electricity because, you know, without the Internet or things like that, you're always waiting on some TV show or some newspaper or behind-the-scenes movie magazine or something to give you the, the little uh, the clips, not clips, but, you know, the, the photos from on the set and stuff. And then I remember specifically Return of the Jedi because I had already moved to Hollywood and I was working at the Grauman's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard, which is where Star Wars, the original one, premiered. And it was going to the third one was going to premiere at the Egyptian Theater down the street. And I remember walking to work down Hollywood Boulevard and people camped out on Hollywood Boulevard with sleeping bags and all their food and everything. And Lucasfilm was putting money into the Egyptian Theater. They were redoing the sound system and I think they were upgrading like, you know, the seating and all that kind of stuff. I mean, just the buzz just in the air, it was palpable. I mean, that kind of electricity, I think, is is once again going to be right around the corner. I think people, I love the Clone Wars. I'm so glad to be a part of it. But I don't want to hang on to that because I know there's really good stuff coming. And especially with people like, you know, I'm sure everyone at the, the team in Lucasfilm with five films in the mix, I'm sure they're taking everybody that they can and throwing them on those live action features. You know, I mean, that's a lot of stuff and you got to have a lot of talent working on that, you know. So I'm looking forward to what's coming. Uh, like I said, if you guys could have been there, like I said, when you see people camped out, we had um, at the Grauman's, we also did uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark films there. And we had people camping out for um, what was it? The second one, Temple of Doom, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I remember people lined up around our theater, camped out for that. And that was when George and Stephen came and we had a big ceremony to put their hands and sneaker prints in the cement outside the studio. Uh, that was back in like in May of 1984. They had a whole bunch of people dressed up like Indiana Jones. I mean, there's just I, I kind of miss that sort of thing that used to happen at the at the cinema when everyone would wait for the next Lucas or Spielberg film, you know, because you knew it was just going to be good. Oh, for sure. You know, and I think, you know, getting people uh, like somebody like J.J. Abrams, because when Super 8 came out, I watched that film and I really felt like I was watching a, a throwback to a Steven Spielberg film from the 1980s. It just had that same glossy, polished feel, you know, everything about, you know, Spielberg's films from that time period, whether it's, you know, E.T. or Close Encounters or, you know, you name it. I mean, you know, I, I love that that feel was definitely there, you know, kind of like with the Poltergeist films that Spielberg produced, you know. You could still feel that the Spielberg touch coming through on those films, even though he wasn't directing them. Oh, yeah, no, totally good, especially on Super 8, because I remember when I went to go see that in the theater, I, I was watching it, and, like, I, f I think maybe about a third of the way through the movie, I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, wow, I feel like a kid again. This Definitely. is so awesome. I, I love that, that movie. That, no, I got that feeling, too, especially since I was a Super 8 filmmaker as a kid. It took me back two times like to doing that as a kid and then watching a film is like yeah i remember this this is like when i came out to hollywood and these are the kinds of films that were being shown here and you'd run over to the cinerama dome or the you know the grauman's or you know the uh, the warner uh, triplex on hollywood boulevard those are like three big places in hollywood where you'd get really cool movies opening up you know uh, stuff like back to the future i remember seeing that at the cinerama dome i must have saw that a gazillion times. I think I, w I watched it and immediately went out to the box office and bought another ticket for the next show and sat down and watched it again. And I didn't even have to do that, but because I was working at a theater at the time and we all had a, all the theaters along Hollywood Boulevard and in that area all had agreement that you would pass in each other's employees to, you know, each other's theater, you know, just as a, as a professional courtesy. And I didn't even have time to do that to contact the manager. I just went out and got a ticket. <laughs> so like, I'm not waiting. See that film. You know, but uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm kind of looking, I'm hoping that that kind of experience comes back again with the, with the next trilogy coming up. I think it definitely has the potential for it. Oh, well, you know, we know you've worked a lot with Disney. And, you know, on that note, we were actually wondering, like, what your take is on what Disney is going to add, you know, or what it does add to Star Wars to maybe help, uh, I guess you could say, maybe ease the fears of some of the Star Wars fans who are maybe a little bit leery of it or maybe even feel like they might have been burnt with, you know, the recent rash of uh, project cancellations and, you know, the video games that have been put on hold and things of that nature. You know, we're just wondering, like, you know, what's your take on it? 
Well, you know, I know I do work a lot with Disney. In fact, I have a new series starting up with them. Uh, you know, something not Clone Wars related, something else. And you know, they're 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 a very big corporation. But you know, sometimes you may not agree with what they do, but they always seem to pull off. You know, they they end up doing things right. I'm a big fan of the theme parks. You know, I do a lot of work for them too. And you know, they're talking now about you know they've been they put out that survey that was asking people if they'd like to see a Star Wars land at uh, at the theme parks. Like that would be great. I mean, that could be the best you know redo of uh, Tomorrowland at Disneyland uh, that I can oh, yeah. possibly think of. You know, because they're always struggling to how to make it futuristic or retro. It's like you put Star Wars in there, man, you got it. That's a snitch. just take my money now. Yeah, just take all of it. Yeah, it's like that. It's like that one meme on the internet. Shut up and take my money. No, seriously, and you know you have to remember that it's not only Disney. I'm sure Disney is working very closely with Kathleen Kennedy, and I'm sure she went into a. Uh, I, I can't say because I'm I'm not at Lucasfilm, but I'm sure she went into you know and saw like you know the things needed to be streamlined or you know maybe they were you know just George was just doing things on a, I don't want to say on a whim, but just wherever his imagination moved him. And maybe they're trying to tighten the organization, and that might be why certain things, you know, like games or whatever, have been put on the back burner or shelved for the time being or whatever. And they really want to focus on the movies because that's really what built Lucasfilm is the films. I mean, it's been a long, it's been running, you know, we've had like the animated series and the games and things like that, but that's not really what the, you know, the heart of that organization is the heart of that organization is films like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and all those great iconic characters that came out of those uh, franchises. Mm, I, can, so I, I can definitely agree with that. I mean, I, I, you know, I trust Disney. Like I say, I may not, you know, myself and other fans, we may not all agree or like, no, why are you doing this? But, you know, they, I'm sure they have a much bigger plan in mind and, uh, you know, they, they want to move forward. And I'm actually very, actually really surprised so soon after the the purchase came that they immediately announced, oh, we're going to be doing films. I mean, I'm like with a lot of other people thinking, well, I, they're probably never, we're never going to see another Star Wars film made again in my lifetime, you know. And here it is, you know. Uh, now we're not only seeing another one, I'm seeing, you know, the that final trilogy that's been talked about for so long. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm hoping some you know, some of the original cast comes back to it, you know, playing, uh, you know, their characters, you know, appropriately, you know, what, however much time is supposed to have passed. I think that'd be awesome. Oh, I, I, agree. I fully agree. Yeah. See, there you go. In unison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I completely agree. Because that's what I was saying, because, you know, I had mentioned that to uh, Jeremiah when, um, because when we were first, uh, when it was first announced, he was the one that let me know about it because, you know, with all my uh, moving and, you know, new family life and everything, I haven't exactly been able to keep my finger on the pulse, so to speak. But I was at work and I got 400 calls in the space of 20 minutes <laughs> and text messages. And then, and like, you know, I got to go to a computer. And I feel special because then he called me. And, and I was like, oh, because I knew he was busy. <laughs> but he tells me about it. And I was like, whoa, dude, wait a second. Sequels? Think about it. I mean, Mark Hamill's like a lot older. He could play like, you know, the wise and older, you know, Luke. I mean, it, exactly. it, it, it could happen. No, you know, I, think, I mean, Harrison Ford, I think, is a is sort of a, you know, a more weathered, grizzled Han Solo who's seen a lot now. I mean, that has got to be such an interesting <sighs> character, you know. Oh, <laughs> you just, you know, just got to go there and see it, right? I, I mean, <laughs> so much money for that. Yeah, and the <laughs> great thing about, in you know, the, the Clone Wars is over, but the great thing what the Clone Wars did is it, it kept the fires burning when there really wasn't anything. And I think it did more than anyone ever anticipated. I remember when the Clone Wars was first announced, a lot of friends of mine were like, because the rumors were out that Lucasfilm was going to do a live action series. And I actually yeah. knew a lot of people that were actually disappointed that it was going to be an animated thing and not a live action. I'm and I guilty. Think, I, I think, you know, the an, you know the anticipation for live action was like, oh, it's just going to be a cartoon. And then this cartoon grew into this thing that captured another generation's hearts and minds, this younger generation that maybe hadn't even seen the films yet. Now they are primed and ready to see the next, you know, the next installment of these, uh, these films. So, you know, whether or not they do another animated series to complement whatever else they're doing, that remains to be seen. But, you know, Clone Wars was a finite thing. You can't do that forever because that is a finite amount of time between episode two and three. If you're going to do other animated stuff, you kind of want to go to the next thing. It's like, well, let's not just talk about the, the Clone Wars. Let's talk about whatever else is happening on. So whether that gets explored in animation or live action or in the films, 
uh, I, that remains to be seen. But it looks like, you know, with those two offshoot movies, those really interest me just as much as the, the next trilogy does. I, I fully agree. So uh, my next question is going to be one that's uh, very different than what we've just asked because you know, we've heard lots of interviews with you. Um, you're on uh, Rebel Force Radio and you know other podcasts quite a bit. But one of the things that intrigues me is that you've done a lot of work with visual effects. Yes. Even on your on your Wikipedia, it says exactly. you know you're you know you're a voice actor, voice match, but you're also a visual f effects um, person. So why don't you talk about your work with Boss Film Studios and Tibbet Studios? Yeah, back in the day, before I was able to get into voiceover and didn't know how to do it, and when I was struggling back in the in the 1980s, I you know I went to uh, I had been making films on my own at home, back home in Florida, and when I went to film school, I really wasn't as focused as I should have been. I wanted to do everything, and fortunately, I went to an incredible uh, film school called Columbia College that's now, it used to be uh, in Hollywood on La Brea Avenue next to uh, Red Fox Studios and Mole Richardson, the big lighting, you know, film lighting company. They're now out in Tarzana, I believe, in the old Panavision building, but in there, I got to meet and got taught by all these incredible teachers like Gene Warren Jr., whose father, Gene Warren Sr., did the special did When Worlds Collide in the Time Machine. Gene Warren Jr. was working on the visual effects for the Terminator, the original one, while he was teaching our Cinematography 3 class. Uh, we had people like Pete Gibbons, who had been one of the original engineers on uh, the Cinerama camera system, was also like head of visual effects at Universal Studios. He was another cinematography teacher. So my love for visual effects, the, the fire for that started to really grow in film school. And I, for my final project, they actually gave me like a separate, they paid for a separate camera package so I could have a stop motion unit doing this uh, in a live action unit. So I could have two units going together to do my final project, which was really unheard of at that school at the time. But Al Rossman, the, uh, the head of the, the dean of the cinema department, he was this hardcore New, New Yorker. He's like, Stanton, if anybody can pull it off, you can you know, so my hat's off to that guy for doing that. But when I got out of film school, um, like I said, I still didn't really know how to get into voiceover. I had been doing things for people and, you know, narrating and stuff. But I, I went with another one of my loves, which is visual effects. And uh, I did get a chance to work for Richard Edlin over at Boss Film uh, when that was around in Marina Del Rey. For those of you out there, your listeners that don't know who Richard Edlin and he was Ed Edlin is, uh, he was one of the original guys at ILM with Don John Dykstra that did the visual effects for Star Wars and went on to do Raiders of the Lost Ark and all kinds of stuff and then went on opened his own company. He took over um, uh, now my, his name is escapes me. Uh, I can't believe it. Uh, Doug Trumbull's company. Uh, EEG uh, and Doug Trumbull, of course, did 2001: A Space Odyssey and Star Trek: The Motion Picture. He took over Doug Trumbull's company in the Marina and started doing his own films like Ghostbusters and Die Hard and things like that. And I had a chance to, you know, to work with him, so I took it <laughs> and got to work on films like, you know, Batman Returns and Alien Three. Um, what else did I work on over there? Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. Yes, the Stallone picture. That was a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, we had. <laughs> there was some crazy pyrotechnic happenings that happened on, on Cliffhanger once where we burned the entire cliff set down to the ground, uh, melted a camera pretty much, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was crazy times because this was sort of just the very beginnings of the digital era. And, and as a matter of fact, I worked with the head of the CGI department, uh, Jim Rigel, who went on to... He's won, won numerous Academy Awards for his visual effects in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Jim's the uh, the CGI department at Boss Films was, was literally Jim Rigel, uh, a college student that was working there for free. And then they said, and they threw me into the mix too because I had a film background and they needed somebody in the CG department that knew film. Uh, so I was kind of like the liaison between the film end of the studio and the CG end of the studio. So I was really there on what they call the bleeding edge of that technology where we were, you know, trying to do literally the impossible. I remember in Alien 3, there's one digital composite in there, and it's at the very end of the film when they throw the, after the alien comes out of the molten lead, they throw the hot, uh, they throw the cold water on him, and his head cracks, and you see this crack go through the alien's head, and that was yeah. our very first digital composite. It was, we, we scanned in uh, the background plate of that alien, 
And then Moro Marissa, who was an old time uh, animator, he wasn't old, he was just what I'm saying, old school animator, went on a, you know, on a light board and he traced this crack, you know, frame by frame, drew it, animated it. And then I had to put up a rig on the, on the CG scanner to um, scan each one of these uh, frames of this crack, this animation. And then Jim Rigel and, you know, I can't remember who else worked on it, they composited that onto the, and it was only 24 frames long. But there it was, our first digital composite ever. I mean, this is wow. way back, you know, prior to like Jurassic Park and all that stuff when people were really building their own equipment to make all that stuff. And then when I left Boss, uh, I left, you know, I got out of visual effects and I was working in voiceover. And a friend of mine uh, who, uh, I, who I had trained over at Boss, it kind of like he was kind of like took over for me and was, you know, doing very well for himself, went on to work for a number of studios. He was working for Phil Tippett, and he called me up out of the blue one day and said, hey, we're getting to work on this really big movie called Starship Troopers, and uh, I need somebody that can do, you know, what you did at Boss, because at that time there was only a handful of people that knew much about it, and they were all working. So I was like the only guy that was like available and uh, but I, you know, I was like, no, I don't do it anymore. But well, they kept pestering me and pestering me. And finally, you know, I, you know, they, they made the offer so good. And then, to be honest, as a Star Wars and a stop motion fan, the opportunity to work with Phil Tippett, it just it overcame me. And I thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to work with a guy who's like Ray Harryhausen. So I took the job with the commitment of like taking a year and a half off. And I actually stayed there for a little bit longer, probably like three or four years, probably four. I can't remember exactly how long, but we, I, after Starship Troopers was over, I said, I really want to get back to voiceover. They said, we really like you to stay. And I said, well, if I can continue my voiceover career during the day, I'll come and work for you guys during the evening. And they said, fine, no problem. So I ended up staying there and had a great time. I actually got to meet Ray Harryhausen on a couple of occasions because he was friends with Phil. So yeah, the, the incredible times, a really, really hard work during that, doing that stuff. Um, wouldn't uh, wouldn't change it wouldn't go wouldn't do it now, but I certainly wouldn't go back and change anything. Those are really lifetime once in a lifetime experiences. Yeah, because you got to work with you know on a Fincher movie, you got to work on a Tim Burton movie, you got to work on um, Verho uh, Verhoeven movies, you got to work on Michael Bay movie. You, you got to work on with a lot of a like lot of big movies. time big time directors in their films and. Uh, you know, that's not that's an experience that a lot of people don't have, especially people that do voice work because I don't know a lot of them tend to seem to start it when they're a kid and then that's what they want to do and they go into radio or something. Well, you did special effects and that's something that you don't get a lot of. No, yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I had a lot of different passions and uh, like I said, I was really wearing myself out at one. I mean, especially after Tippet because I was doing voiceover and visual effects and I was completely exhausted. By the time I left, I said, you know, I, I really have to make a decision. And, of course, my first love is uh, is voiceover. So, you know, I, I bid them a fond farewell and thank them for everything. And, you know, uh, but really went back to uh, to working in in, uh, in voiceover. But I, I don't know how many times you guys have uh, interviewed people in the visual effects industry on your show. But uh, to people out there listening, it is probably one of the hardest jobs out there. I think it's even more grueling and, you know, now that it's digital, the whole point of doing computers was supposed to make everything easier and cheaper. And it just didn't exactly just because you could do anything with a pixel. People started coming up with ideas that they never would have come up with on their own. I remember reading a boss, the original script for The Watchmen, and it had gone around town. I think at the time, um, Terry Gilliam was... Uh, was attached to it and it just kept going around town and everyone said it can't be done you know it cost a billion dollars to do the special effects that this script calls for you know and it was a really great script very different a little especially the opening was very different from you know the one that we ended up seeing but uh you know thankfully digital came around and the photo optical you know effects kind of gone off to the wayside and anything became possible but then you started seeing people you know working on a shot you know like Oh, well, I'm working on, you know, take number 52, and now I'm working on take 152 because they can keep going in and changing something over and over and over. It's not like in the old days you're going to blow up a model. You got one shot and maybe five cameras watching it, and you blow it up, and that did. If it didn't work, it's really expensive to redo something. But digital, yeah, you just send, you send the person, the artist, back to their desk and keep having them do it until they get it right. You really have to have an iron stamina to be in visual effects these days. 
Yes, and I, for one, salute our future robot overlords. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, the people that do visual effects now, my hat's off to them. I could never, ever do what, uh, you know, the way they do it now. I mean, uh, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. And it's reached a level that is just, you know, beyond, you know, it, it's, it's now, you know, gets, you, you can go and make things completely photorealistic if you want. And it just looks like it's there. I mean, I remember back in the days when they're like, oh, you know, smoke is a problem. Fire is a problem. Hair is a problem. Cloth is a problem. You know, <laughs> build something with an exoskeleton so it doesn't have to have flesh, you know. So <laughs> machines we can make look real, you know, humans, eh, not so much. You know, but now, you know, you, you know, you got the whole issue of going into the uncanny valley with things looking, you know, too spookily real. I mean, you know, it's come a long, long way since, uh, you know, Jurassic Park back in 92 or 93, whenever that was. Yeah, uh, 93, was... 20th anniversary this year. So, yes. Such for... a good movie. Such a good yeah, movie. 20th, yeah. In 3D, I think it's being released. Yes. Oh, yep. In, uh, in two weeks at that. Yeah, yes, I just April saw the, the first 5th. Trailer. I remember, I so, remember the day that that came out, and I was working at Boss, and the whole crew in the CGI department was all kind of like, you know, wonder how that. And finally, I just told everybody, I said, look, just go across the street to the cinema at the mall and go watch the thing, because no one could sit still thinking about that thing being out there. And they all came back like with their eyes as big as saucers, like, oh man, we got a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> We're obsolete now. I mean, it really blew everybody in the industry away. At least I can say from you know being working at Boss. I mean, everyone came back there like, wow, I didn't know we could do that, or that that technology was out there. But I think it inspired everybody more than anything else, you know. Mm. Well, you know, going back a little bit, touching on the uh, voice matching, just out of curiosity, have you ever, like, tried to count it or, like, figure out how many voices you can match? I think, yeah, I actually had to do a list not that long ago. It was, it was, it was over 300, actually. Over the course of my career, I think it's been over 300 different uh, voice matches, you know, from cartoons well, to celebrities to, you know different characters and all that kind of stuff yeah so any it's favorites a lot pardon me what was that any any favorites um gosh favorites it may be sean connery is one of my favorites <laughs> yes <laughs> and uh oh i actually I always did like doing george w bush because i don't know he's former president of the united states of america and he's uh he said a lot of funny things sometimes <laughs> you know <laughs> um let's see you know there's yeah there's got a William Shatner, you know, the it's, it's all in the shoulders, you know, the, you know, the, the game, the, the, to do the video games, to, uh, the, the danger, the risk, the travel time, to do a voiceover at a studio, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you, you, you have to do it physically, you know, to, there's a physicality that goes in with a lot of those, but otherwise they just don't work because you have to do, you know, the physical man, you're like, you know, Rich Little, uh, you know, would always do Johnny Carson, you know, get all the stiff and ramrod and do all the... The positions you're like, you know, are you ready for this? You want to hear this? True story, true story. You know, <laughs> you know that <laughs> stuff. You know, you got to, even while I'm doing that, I'm doing the things with my cufflinks and all the stuff. You know, your younger listeners won't understand that. Go. No, go, I, I got that watch one. The D the pencil thing. are all there. <laughs> <laughs> it's when the Johnny Carson tap of the pencil. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, it's even the cartoon ones, you know, uh, you know, uh, there's plenty of those in there. You know, you're like doing everything from Tigger, you know, uh, for the Disney Studios. Ooh, yeah, that guy. And um, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, Snagglepuss. You know, exit stage right. Oh, it's one of my favorites. You know, I try to do that one all the time, but it never comes out right. Yeah, he's a tough one. You got to be, uh, you got to hey, get the well, breath. Wait a second. Since we have you on and you know how to do it, maybe I can do mine for you and you could gauge it for me. All right, let's hear. Let's try it. Let's hear how you do it. Oh, exit stage right. Or left even. <laughs> I think there's got to be a little more. It's got it's to be drawn out. And you have to hear the breath even. And it has to go, you know, like the way yes. I'm doing it. <laughs> oh, I'm going I'm to have to listen to this and work on it. That's awesome. Well, that's all, that's all I ever did. I mean, and that is the key to all this stuff. I mean, that's why, you know, if I haven't done a voice, you know, even like, let's say in the Clone Wars, it was like two years since I had done Tark and I really had to go in there and get all my reference going and decide what I was going to do and if I was going to keep it the same or change it up. And I, and I wanted to change it because, you know, he was getting a little more power hungry. So I thought I'd go with that more sort of, uh, you know, that very sort of short staccato sort of delivery. You know, he's being I'm short tempered. I don't have time for this sort of thing, you know, but still the younger version of, of the Peter Cushing uh, uh, Grand Moff. 
but yeah, you have to practice. If you don't practice it, you you know the cobwebs start to go there. <laughs> and I've been in plenty of voiceover sessions where you're in doing an animated series, and this would be a character that maybe somebody has done for a couple of years and haven't done it in a couple of years, and they'll bring out the reference and play it for you because you know as voice actors, we're doing you know a, a cartload of auditions per day, and then you know multiple jobs per day sometimes, and then. You know, a lot of time goes by and then, you know, it gets all jumbled in your head. I remember Neil Ross telling me that back in the 80s when he was doing like, uh, let's see, the 80s or 90s, he had like, you know, eight or nine cartoon series going simultaneously. He used to have to put a cassette tape in the car on the way to the job and, you know, make sure he was doing the right voice for the right show, you know. Yeah, no, I, I hear you wow. on that one or else like... You know, you, you could be sitting there doing Snagglepuss, and the next thing you know, it turns into Sean Connery, and you have no idea how it happened. Yeah, you do have to stay focused, especially when you're doing multiple roles on a, on a show, which is usually the case in animation. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're like, you know, you know, the main character, and you've got a lot of dialogue. Most of the time, you know, you're doing at least two two characters, sometimes three. Uh, and I, when, when I did G.I. Joe Renegades, you know, I played Tomax and Zamot, and I had a lot of scenes where those two were just talking to each other, and they decided to just record those in real time. So it wasn't like I did one voice all the way through and then went back into the other. I keep switching back and talking to myself. <laughs> so they're making you ping pong. <laughs> exactly. So you really have to stay on top of your game to do that kind of stuff and, and do it successfully. So you don't, you know, accidentally do the wrong voice and you know, uh, you know, and for the wrong character. And you sometimes you'll see that and, you know, sometimes you'll watch old cartoons and all of a sudden the, the wrong voice will come out of like a character. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? Did the animators mess up? Did the actor just forget? You know, suddenly knows? the animator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> 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 so I guess we're going to begin wrapping up um, a bit since, you know, we've taken uh, quite a bit of your time. So I guess what we're going to ask now is uh, what have you been working on recently other than Clone Wars? Because I know you had a game that you've been uh, talking about quite a bit. So what have you been working on recently, and uh, what are some current projects that you can uh, promote to the fans? Well, let's see. Well, I, like I said, I do have a new Disney series coming out. I can't really say too much about that because it's still in the very early stages of, uh, of recording the episodes for that. But I, that, it's, it's a lot of fun, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of good characters and a lot of great cast, an incredible cast, people like myself. Uh, Maurice LaMarche, uh, Billy West, uh, Kevin Michael Richardson, Bill Farmer were all involved in this. Um, the Cave, the video game you were mentioning that just came out from Double Fine, uh, Ron Gilbert directed that. Uh, that was just so much fun to do. If, you're, if, if you like the Double Fine games like Psychonauts and Jack Black's Brutal Legend and things like that, uh, I definitely recommend checking out The Cave. Uh, Double Fine stuff has got such a really interesting, quirky sense of humor, and the stories are so good. I'm always excited when I get to work uh, with those guys on something. Uh, of course, I've got a uh, new government issue Joseph stop motion video came out, kind of, kind of uh, putting that series back into action again on YouTube. So if you've got your fans of uh, Joseph, Hamish, uh, and Cappy, and the other characters on there, Gustav, uh, go check that on YouTube. I've got a they're hilarious. great one where they're inter they're, Joe just, uh, um, he's reviewing the DVD of The Hobbit that just came out. So uh, that, <laughs> that's very current. Um, there's, you know, always, there's always commercial work going on. You, you know, I've always, you know, I've got things for Blue Cross and Chili's restaurants and uh, a number of other, I'm, you know, forgetting, you know, the products that I'm working on right now, but sometimes there gets to be so many uh, that you do. What's that? And didn't a certain film project where uh, Mr. Trey Stokes also finished recently? Yes, uh, we did the Pink Five Saga, which uh, we're going to preview, uh, do another sneak. We sneak previewed it once in AllCon. <laughs> Great audience. They, they loved it. We've got another sneak preview coming up in May, on May 11th in Long Beach. So if you're in the, uh, the greater Los Angeles area in Southern California, you should really come down to Long Beach on May 11th. Whoops. Oh, at the Long Beach C Convention Center, at Long Beach Comic Con. There you go. Not just at Long Beach, anywhere. Yeah, not at the Queen Mary, none of those places. Long Beach Comic Con at the Long Beach uh, Convention Center. Uh, if you're around on May 11th, uh, please stop by and see the screening. Uh, we're always looking for, uh, you know, for more feedback so Trey can tighten that up and, you know, uh, you know, get that thing finalized. It's looking really great, and I was really glad to be a part of it. I, in that, I play on screen old Ben Kenobi and, of course, you know, the evil Emperor Palpatine, <laughs> which was a ton of fun to play that character. 
And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the finale. I haven't been able to see it yet. And didn't they also say because he got enough money in his Kickstarter that he's also going to work on a prequel episode or a prequel mini episode? I think he was talking about possibly doing some sort of, a, you know, kind of a prequel, maybe trailer, teaser, something like that. But the main focus is right now is to get this this uh, bad boy finished because, he's, you know, this has been this is 10 years. This marks the 10th uh, anniversary of the, the release of the original Pink Five. Uh, so this oh, wow, is wow, it has been ten years. And if you see it, I mean, uh, you'll be blown away by it. I mean, the, you feel like you're watching a Star Wars movie. I mean, the special effects are right on par, you know, with like you know the stuff that you see, you know, coming out of ILM. It's you know, phenomenal. he's got a bunch of people, you know, from the industry that volunteered to work on it. So I mean, you're watching it, and you know, it's. You know, like he was, Trey was saying, he goes, well, he goes, well, J.J. Abrams may be doing the next Star Wars uh, film, but I'm directing, you know, the current one right now, and that's the Pink Five saga. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to that. You know, because Jerry over here, he don't stop talking about it. And about, I'm like, it's hilarious. I have to see this. I want to see this. Where is it? <laughs> Are we talking about Pink Five or are we talking about Pink Five? No, yeah. Pink Five. Pink. I'm well, like, not, no, not the original, the, the, what, what's com- you know, what's coming. I'm yeah, like, I, I know. see it. It's not online yet. It's actually going to be once it gets finished. It's going to be making doing the con circuit. That's the plan. Uh, right. Because really, what it, it, it's to watch it on a computer just does not do the thing justice. It really needs to be seen on a big screen, just like uh, just like a movie. I mean, uh, it really it's it's an incredible experience when you see it on uh, in a in a movie theater of some sort, as opposed to just watching it on, on a laptop or you know a computer screen on your desktop. Well, let's hope Celebration 7. So um, I guess, you know, for us, the last thing, um, as, uh, as, our final qu- as our final question, Ket would like you to bid b- farewell to Bombay Radio using the voice of Moralo. We miss oh, Uncle Moralo! <laughs> this is Moralo Evol saying farewell to Bombad Radio. It's my favorite podcast while I was incarcerated. <laughs> Thank you.